This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life is hard sometimes, and there are many pathways in navigating the inevitable ups and downs of life. In riding these waves, I look to my yoga practice and also therapy. We all go through tough times like big life changes, periods of instability, conflict, or loss. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist entirely online, which is very convenient, flexible, and suited to fit your schedule. Take the questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist. And if it's not the right match for you, no worries. You can change your therapist for no additional charge. Sometimes getting started in therapy is the hardest part. To make it a little bit easier, go to the link provided in the show notes or go to visit betterhelp.com slash yoga and podcast today to get 10% off your first month. Popping out in the sun, we welcome everyone. Gave a hundred and one, the goal is having fun. I'm happy, like I told ya. I'm stretching now, doing yoga, not stopping till it's over. Don't want the day to be done. I'm happy, like I told ya. I'm stretching now, doing yoga, not stopping till it's over. Welcome, friends, to Yoga and Podcast. This show highlights the science and brings the magic of yoga and mind-body practices down to earth for the everyday person to help you live your best life. I'm your host, Ashley Weber, a yoga and Pilates teacher and forever student who is oh so curious about all things yoga and. I'm super excited to share with you this upcoming conversation. Now, let's Sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode, y'all. Amy Huffman helps high achievers and entrepreneurs develop mental strength, heal holistically, and optimize their performance. She is a wellness educator and mentor and is passionate about using yoga as therapy to help people be powerful so that they can do powerful things in the world. She is a yoga therapist and health coach based in Austin, Texas. Please welcome to the show, Amy Huffman. Hey, Amy, how are you today? Hello. Hey, Ashley. I am doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah. I'm so happy to have you on. We know each other through a mutual friend. And this, in a roundabout way, we connected, and I'm so glad we connected because today I love the topic, the gunas, polyvagal theory. But before we get into that, would you care to introduce yourself just a little bit more and tell us who you are in the world of yoga? Yeah. So I am a yoga therapist and uh, certified with the International Association of Yoga Therapists. And I have been teaching mindfulness and nervous system regulation uh, in the private setting and also in the corporate setting for the last seven to eight years now. Um, at the heart of my teaching and therapy practice is really helping people widen their window of tolerance, mm. um, widen the window of tolerance to the messiness of life, mm. also known as stress and anxiety and all the things that come with it. Um, helping people reduce these rajasic tendencies, some kind of setting us up here uh, for our convo, um, those rajasic tendencies of anxiety and addiction and even um, irritability and obsession. Um, and also looking at how I can help people reduce those tamasic tendencies. Mm. So numbness, depression, um, checking out, feeling like life has lost its joy in a way. Mm-hmm. But that goal of helping people develop their capacity to access these sweeter sophic states and feel more confident and able to step into the challenges and opportunities of life. So that's a little of my why anyways. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And um, we're going to talk about polyvagal theory. Could you explain polyvagal theory and the gunas and how they are connected? I will. And I will do my best to be concise and sweet with this. It's such a broad, deep, 
topic, especially when you uh, separate them out. I feel like we could talk for hours and hours about each one. Um, but the polyvagal theory is a theory developed by Stephen Porges in the 90s. And in its simplest form, it's a theory of how the nervous system is wired to work Ooh. and offers a map of the nervous system to navigate. It explores the relationship between the autonomic nervous system mm. and social behavior through two pathways of the vagus nerve. So that vagus nerve is the main connector into the parasympathetic nervous system. So that rest and digest for any listeners who um, are familiar or unfamiliar with that term. And the vagus nerve within the polyvagal theory acts as this checks and balances system for the sympathetic branch, the more the fight, the flight, mm -hmm. and the freeze. Mm -hmm. So the vagus nerve is a, a vagal break, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the theory proposes that our mammalian autonomic nervous system evolved for adaptive behavior strategies to support us in feeling safe, um, to defend to bond socially. Mm. And so it's really influenced by the vagus nerve, by the tone of the vagus nerve. And that helps us to respond to cues from the environment around us and within our own system. Mm. So there's three main neural platforms within the polyvagal theory. So you can, it's explained as a hierarchy. Um, we'll probably get into why I feel like a hierarchy isn't always the most accurate way to describe it. Mm -hmm. But the three neural platforms within the polyvagal theory, you've got the social engagement system, which is the ventral vagal system. Mm. And this really supports, um, when we think about the gunas, the, the sapa, the sweetness, Mm -hmm. This allows us to be in a state where we can engage with other people. We can feel connected. We can play. Um, it regulates the muscles of our face and on uh, the tone of our voice, facial expressions, listening. So that's the, that's shown at the top of the hierarchy mm -hmm. um, in most polyvagal theory charts. And then you move down into that middle neural platform, which is the sympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. mobilization. That's fight, flight, freeze, or even faint behaviors. That's the survival mode. That's the car pulls out in front of us and we get that jolt. Uh -huh. um, and so that neural platform is really dependent on the functioning of the sympathetic nervous system, um, which is opposite of the parasympathetic, which I mentioned earlier. And that's really associated with a faster heart rate, increase in muscle tone, um, increase metabolic activity. And then we move into the third layer of the hierarchy, which is the dorsal vagal complex. Mm. And that is more of like the behavior <laughs> shut down. Um, the dog's barking. <laughs> 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 and immobilization associated with feigning death. Um, it's the most primitive response to stress. Mm. And that innervates with the organs just below the diaphragm. Oh, okay. <laughs> So let's see here, dorsal vagal complex. So that third piece of the three neural platforms. Mm -hmm. So that is the behavioral shutdown, immobilization. Um, you can think about, you know, the turtle who recoils into its shell. Mm. And that's really the most primitive response to stress. So when we think about the polyvagal theory and the evolutionary um, aspect of it, the dorsal vagal is said to be the most primitive and what developed first. So we think about these three neural platforms as being layered onto each other. Mm. And so, you know, I think really at the core of, of polyvagal theory and how it applies into yoga and yoga therapy is that the vagus nerve here matters and its tone matters. Mm. And that is really um, when we look at how we can change our nervous system, keeping these neural platforms in mind, we're working with the vagus nerve mm -hmm. and the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm. Yeah. So I'll pause there for a moment. Any follow up before I get into the goodness? <laughs> I know that can, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, well, hmm. I really love the way you explain it. Like in three, there are three different categories going from, I guess, least primal to most primal mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. how to look at that. Okay. Yep. I feel yep. like that's a simple way to kind of put them 
like a new concept kind of to into the brain. Um, and so the gunas. The gunas. So then you've got the, the gunas. And I think I'll uh, revert to the Bhagavad Gita here for this mm-hmm. one. Um, the Gita describes the gunas as those that underlie and shape the characteristics of of everything everything that is of material nature and that exists within property our material world and their physical and mental and behavioral attributes so you've got sattva which is also described as um you know lightness a relaxed alertness Mm. the qualities of buoyancy joy and understanding Mm. uh the foundation for wisdom and and clear seeing and i'll just plant the seed here as i'm going through these three gunas maybe you can start to see a little bit of the connection between the three neural platforms so this sattva also correlated with the ventral vagal complex at the top of the hierarchy and that space where we can be engaged and Mm. playful Mm -hmm. So from Sattva Guna, we move into Rajas and Rajas is more activating energy, supports Mm -hmm. movement and creativity and um, motivation can also be associated in an imbalanced way with agitation and obsession or addiction, even hyperactivity and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Looking at the neural platform, Rajas and that sympathetic activation, that fight or flight, you can start to see those overlapping patterns, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And then the third guna being tamas, that quality of inertia, um, said to be associated with delusion or heaviness, even like an indifference or a shutting down, if you will. Um, and that said, tamas can also provide support you know, there's stability, there's groundedness. Mm. Um, and I think that's important to touch on with the gunas of you can be in a balanced place with these qualities, and then you can be imbalanced. Mm. Um, you know, a balanced tamas would look like groundedness and stability. Um, balanced rajas would look like creativity and um, the ability to find that energy for inspiration and change. And then, you know, Safa is Safa. It's that that sweet space. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at the gunas and the three neural platforms of polyvagal theory, you can see that there is this constant movement and state shift and change or qualities shifting and changing. Mm-hmm. Um, they're coexisting with each other. And it's really the different proportions of each. Um, in material objects or within ourselves, within the nervous system, Mm -hmm. that really give rise to to context and what we're experiencing, how we think, um, how stories might influence where we are now from a nervous system state and what qualities we then bring forth into our lives and our worlds. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that there's a, a lot of translational framework, if you will, for the polyvagal theory and the neural platforms from a neuroscience perspective. And then you have the gunas, this ancient wisdom. And you really see how they can start to work together to provide a solid foundation and framework that incorporates both the East and the West Mm -hmm. and helping people move closer towards well-being and resilience and growth. Um, And also where, where I really gravitated to was this overlapping between ancient wisdom and neuroscience and being able to have a framework to move yoga and yoga therapy um, into a clinical setting, into a research setting Mm. um, in a really valid way. Yeah. I mean, to have this polyvagal theory that came out in the nineties, and then you have this ancient wisdom of the gunas, that is a pretty cool thing these parallels. Are there any misconceptions of polyvagal theory? There are. I think for me personally, um, the deeper I got into my personal practice and study and and, and using it in in clinical setting was the misconception that although the ventral vagal complex is at the top of the hierarchy, that doesn't mean that it is the desired goal. Like Mm. it is the gold star, like that's the end game and we want to stay there. Mm -hmm. And so 
I like to think of taking that hierarchy and flipping it on its side about 90 degrees okay. and having it be more of a spectrum. Okay. And so when you layer the gunas on top of it, the goal is not to always be in a sattvic state yeah. or be in that clear seeing, um, buoyant, most joyous self, but to be able to fluctuate back and forth between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that being able to dance from the higher ventral vagal down into sympathetic, down into dorsal and back up again um, is really the goal. Um, you know, even though you see it at the top of the hierarchy, that's, it's such a pendulum that swings back and forth, um, as we move through these different systems and we all have different baseline neural platforms, mm -hmm. just like we all have different constitutions with gunas. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I gravitate towards being a more tamasic person. And so I've learned how to incorporate more sattvic qualities, or even sometimes more rajas into my life to be able to perform certain tasks or goals or to just feel balanced at times the same way that um you know i can become more aware of my sympathetic activation and what i might need to do to move into ventral vagal knowing that um i won't stay stuck there i'm going to move and shift all of the time but i do have a little more control and choice in in how i shift and how i how i dance if that makes sense. That does make sense. And that leads me to my next questions. What are <laughs> some, well, I believe, I believe it correlates to what are some polyvagal techniques? Mm -hmm. So there is a wide variety of techniques that can um, address the toning of the vagus nerve. And that's when I think of polyvagal techniques, I'm thinking of um, vagus nerve techniques. Mm. And so within my work, I'm doing vagus nerve yoga and techniques, which uh, I'm using yogic techniques and asana and breath um, meditations to influence the vagus nerve to bring in qualities of either sattva or rajas or tamas. Mm. Um, so it's so dependent on the individual, um, but it might be helpful to speak of techniques how they might influence with different gunas and neural platforms in mind. Yeah. So for example, someone who is presenting with excessive rajas, um, overactivation, really stimulated, hyperactive, anxious, I find that meeting them where they're at is really important in getting the parasympathetic nervous system to activate and getting the vagal tone to increase. Ooh. So mobilizing movements thinking of, of like crouching downward dog or primal lunges, warrior poses, oh. um, paired with humming and mantra and chanting that stimulate the throat and the vagus nerve that runs all the way down the side of the neck into the throat, the heart, the lungs, the diaphragm, the gut. Mm -hmm. So actually stimulating and toning from the inside out through humming can be a really great way. Um, anything where I'm creating action potential in asana to greet the rajas and that energy, that sympathetic energy that is mm. there so I can meet it and then start to incorporate almost like little sprinkles of sattva. Uh. Um, and so then I'll start to incorporate uh, extended exhalation. So mm. science and research around extending the exhalation is a beautiful way to increase parasympathetic nervous system and vagal tone. Um, even using cues, and this might really resonate with uh, the yoga teachers who are are listening. And I do have a, a free resource for listeners that is actually a 10 minute vagus nerve yoga practice. You can experience oh. what some of these, these cues and, and poses might be, um, but using very specific language that invites the feeling of the neural platform that we're going for, or that introduces qualities of sattva. So cues like feel the buoyancy in your body, mm. feeling the lightness in the belly or the touch, mm -hmm. um, feeling the sweetness of the meditation, um, even in guided meditations that move down the pathways of the vagus nerve from the muscles of the face and the throat mm. and the heart and the lungs. That's, that's kind of been my, my latest favorite, um, that I actually used within a, a six week research study within my yoga therapy, uh, final research project and found had really, really amazing results with that. Um, 
and then tamas. So looking at what are some polyvagal techniques um, applied in yoga that can influence that heavy energy Mm -hmm. or that numbness or the, the dorsal vagal neural platform of shutting down. So there I'm incorporating a meeting the system where it's at um, more restorative shapes, but then starting to sprinkle some Raja, some activation because Mm -hmm. the hierarchy of dorsal to sympathetic to ventral, you know, there is a certain moving from state to state that does happen in the shift in the dance. So someone who's at the bottom, if we're looking to have them move a little more comfortably into ventral vagal, being able to move through sympathetic and then into that sweet ventral vagal state. Um, so that goes back to some of the action potential movements, um, lion's breath, mm. getting that energy, that heat. And then for someone who who might need tamas sprinkled on to balance rajas, uh, the cues of grounding, of settle, um, havening, uh, self-touch is a really powerful way to start to build a relationship with the nervous system, um, that self-regulation and can be an impactful way to introduce that grounding energy into someone who might be in rajas or in an overly um, hyperactive state. Mm. Wow. These are some great tips. Um, You have overcome chronic bodily pain and mental health challenges. Can you tell us more about how polyvagal theory has supported your healing journey? Mm -hmm. So I've been a competitive athlete from about the age of five. I was a barrel racer and then uh, played volleyball. And so I learned how to push myself physically and mentally from a very, very young age, how to focus and channel self-talk and play at the highest level. And I think a lot of listeners can probably relate to that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I reached a, a stage, I'll call it the first stage where the body starts to whisper to you, right. And gives you cues that you're reaching your threshold and your capacity. It's Mm. like the beep, beep, beep that's going off. And naturally my 19 year old self didn't listen. So it started speaking more loudly in unexpected, inexplicable ways, Mm. panic attacks, chest tightness, body numbing, this fear and, um, this surge of, hyper arousal, that sympathetic state. And it was so unexpected. Um, It's brought a lot of fear into my life for a long time. And then I stepped onto uh, my yoga mat for the first time in a yoga class in college and got this taste of what I now know to be self-regulation and feeling more connected with my body and the cues that I was receiving of heart racing, of chest tightening, of throat tightening, But I was in a safer space where I was then being asked to connect with my breath or to settle or to hear some of those cues that brought me into a downregulated state. Um, And so those unexpected symptoms and inexplicables um, started to make a little more sense. It didn't feel so much like my body was turning against me and I had no idea why. Um, So I began to explore through embodied movement through yoga that physical release of fear and anxiety and um, started to experience how to change my nervous system through breath regulation and my relationship with panic and fear, fear changed. And so then the narrative was like, ah, okay. Like I'm not at odds with this. Like I see you, Um, you're trying to tell me something. I'm a little more open and receptive now And that door just kept getting wider and wider. My curiosity was just insatiable on how I can change, continue Mm -hmm. to change and widen my own window of of tolerance to these, to to sympathetic arousal. And so that was probably the first big like aha moment for me. And that led me into the yoga journey, um, being a teacher specifically. Mm -hmm. And then the, the second big moment for me was, um, you know, entering into adulthood and climbing that corporate ladder as I thought I should and finding myself in a really toxic, high stress startup environment. Mm. And again, my body said, nope, nope, and nope. Um, and it let me know lips swelling, body breaking out in hives, you name it. Oh, but this no. time 
this time I, I had the capacity to listen and it wasn't so much like, this is inexplicable. I have no idea why this is happening. It was like, okay, there's something up here. Yeah. Um, I had heightened sense of, of awareness. And so that was almost five years ago. And since then I've, I've really made it my, my mission, my purpose to help others who are overstimulated, who are, you know, have that the over rajastic tendency demanding roles to learn how to trust themselves and to build resiliency within themselves so that they can continue to step forward into the messiness of life because it doesn't get any less messy, but can also, and also be able to connect with love and joy and buoyancy in those sophic states and that ventral vagal state and that neural platform. Um, and to help people remember they can change their nervous system mm. and their relationship to their inner and, and outer world. Thank you for sharing your story on being a competitive athlete, climbing that corporate ladder and how like giving like clear examples of how your body was like, no, no, no. Like, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we can all relate to that on some level, um, or at least throughout our lives, you know, multiple times, um, what might be some key ways we could, um, build nervous system safely and, um, and regulate using the polyvagal theory, uh, in therapeutic yoga? Mm -hmm. I think dependent on someone's unique history and story, I will always advise working in a safe space with a trusted practitioner, whether that be a psychotherapist who's trained in nervous system regulation, um, a yoga therapist who has a good understanding, who can provide a safe space for you to explore, widening the window of tolerance that I mentioned earlier, um, understanding what it is to get familiar with a hyper aroused sympathetic state of being an overactivation, even though sometimes it might make you feel like you want to crawl out of your skin. Mm. Um, being able to engage with that system and practice techniques to bring you back down, um, practicing what it is to be in a hypo aroused state, mm. numb, maybe feeling like you just don't care, depressed, um, spent, just like burnt out, can't peel myself up off the ground mm -hmm. and being able to slowly, again, sprinkle a little bit of activation, a little bit of movement, um, but just doing so in a very gentle, gentle way of riding the wave. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that um, I really hit home on with, with clients and listeners can take away is just riding the wave, whether it be the emotion, whether it be the sensation, um, riding the wave and knowing that it's, it's not going to last forever. You will reach a threshold, you will reach a peak. And that's really the practice of creating elasticity within the nervous system. And that's where it's going to come from. That's where it's going to happen. And it's not always comfortable, but knowing that once you become more familiar with riding the wave and engaging in these different neural platforms and knowing which qualities to maybe bring in to help you feel more balanced, and there's so much more choice. Mm. Um, there's more context that you can work with. And I think that really unfolds a, a deeper sweetness to life. Um, it just moves you from a place of reacting to stimuli to being able to respond. Oh. Um, you know, I think that so many of us think that we are, our mind and our brain controls the story. And it's really like the story and how we see the world happens in the body first. You know, oh. the nervous system is like this built in surveillance system. And it is responding much quicker than, you know, our minds can keep up with. Mm -hmm. And so when you learn to engage and, and build the window of tolerance with your nervous system, then you're opening up a world of possibility and opportunity um, that just wasn't, wasn't there before. It just moves us closer towards connection and Ooh, choice. That's so exciting when you put it like that. I, I think that's a beautifully put. And I've always loved yoga for the, the fact that it can help bring that awareness where you realize you do have choices, but you're taking it to a deeper level, talking about the, uh, well, the nervous system, polyvagal theory, gunas. From your perspective, what is the trickiest aspect of working at the level of the nervous system? 
I think it is getting comfortable with the discomfort of riding the wave of those different neural Ah. states, you know, of like letting the mind and the brain release because Mm -hmm. there is that like, this is bad. This is good. I'm not in ventral vagal. I'm not feeling that sweetness. I'm, I'm still feeling stuck or angry and just setting that aside and not over identifying with the emotions that come with it. Mm -hmm. Um, We create a lot of unnecessary stress for ourselves when we let the brain and the the mind take over. And that is the practice of mindfulness is being able to back away from that. Um, So learning to ride the wave and there's a certain, there's a certain surrendering. I think that there's, there's two opposites actually that, that happen here in riding the wave. It's like a surrender to what is and like dropping back into like, all right, I'm going to ride this wave of sympathetic activation. And there's a lot of rajas and heat in my system right now. Um, and then also the will, the will to make a different choice. Mm. You know, you have the capacity to listen and to hear where you are in the wave and also to step in to making perhaps a different choice for yourself or making the choice to um, do a restorative practice because you know there's going to be Thomas involved and you're in that overacted state. Mm. So how can you bring yourself back down, if that makes sense? Yeah. So there's Um, a certain wisdom you have to. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, exactly. That, Mm -hmm. that wisdom. Um, Because it's such a normal and kind of going back to one of the misconceptions, it's a normal human experience to move through all of the three states and even the gunas in small shifts in big ways every single day, um, whether we're conscious or unconscious of it. You know, you're scared after that close call with the car pulling out in front of you, mm-hmm. or you're angry at your boss or your partner. Um, you want to collapse at the end of the day because you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. Um, You come home content because, you know, there weren't any fires to put out, Uh you know? So we're always moving through slightly more charged and less charged states um, all the time, day to day. And I think that um, practitioner Deb Dana speaks to this really beautifully in a book called Anchored. She is, um, I believe, a social worker who has been a pioneer in polyvagal theory, um, specifically with, with, trauma uh, with Stephen Porges. And so she really speaks to that of, of being able to just recognize that we're, we're already moving through those states all the time anyways. And so when we become more conscious and we bring a little more intentionality to riding the wave, then that's where we really create like, like real, real change. And, you know, you have to consider as well that if we don't learn to ride the wave and that's where we get stuck in a state, And so while the goal is not to reach ventral vagal and like never experience unpleasant um, rajas or tamas or any Mm -hmm. of the other states, um, we can get stuck in in each of those states. And that's where the imbalance happens. And then that's where stress happens or we get into survival mode or things just feel really heavy and we we suffer. So that riding of the wave, I think, is is really um, the trickiest Mm -hmm. and the most impactful. Mm. Yeah. So why is it important to consider the gunas when it comes to nervous system regulation? I mean, you already kind of mentioned you can get stuck if you don't ride mm-hmm. the wave, mm-hmm. but care to add to that? I think for, for me personally, it's provided greater context for mm-hmm. how the gunas in this ancient wisdom can work for me and bring greater wisdom into my life. Um, the gunas and the polyvagal theory, these neural platforms create this really like global holistic perspective that does combine the modern neuroscience and the ancient wisdom. Mm-hmm. And I think that the tangible states, you know, there's a, a, a graphic that um, I really like, I wish I could pull up right now, but if you could imagine a big circle okay, and this is, this is, um, this is Purusha. This is that observer that all pervading. And then within Purusha, we have property, the oh. material, we have the material world. And then within that circle, you've got three um, innervating circles mm. that are the three neural states. And so you can kind of see how the, the neural platforms of polyvagal theory are nestled into this deep wisdom of Prakriti and Purusha, but in a more tangible felt way. Mm-hmm. I think it just gives more context and um, feeling tone 
to the qualities of sattva and rajas and gunas mm. in a way that just makes it a really deep system. Um, and I think that that awareness of the two and, and how we're always moving and shifting between the, the three gunas and the neural platforms, um, when we when we can really get a sense of that, it provides just another way to to improve our well-being, a greater understanding of, of who we are and how we show up in the world. Um, and it offers us a deeper opportunity for, you know, what, what I really like to bring into my practice is udamonic well-being, um, udamonia, that the sense of fulfillment, oh. um, self-actualization, deep meaning. Um, and I, I think it, it just pairs they pair with each other so beautifully once you can really start to, to feel them um, and doing that on your yoga mat is a really great way. Mm. Will you give us one do and one don't for some one inspiring to build their nervous system flexibility or incorporate this type of work in their teachings? Mm-hmm. I would say do consider those two opposites mm. of of the surrender and the will mm. and knowing that it it requires a little bit of of both to be able to influence change there does have to be that action potential and we as humans are inherently wise and resilient and capable mm. and on that note we're in a culture that really emphasizes the rajas, the doing, the action, the moving forward, the the seeing results quick and now and being better and faster. And so that ability to surrender back and trust the process and trust where you're at um, and your body's capability to regulate with with self and with others. And we didn't really get into this, but the co-regulation piece is mm. um, also a core principle of polyvagal theory of we are wired for social connection and we respond um, not only our neuroception of, of cues within ourselves, but to other people. And so, you know, you and I are co-regulating right now. We're nodding our heads. We're, <laughs> We're opening our eyes. We're smiling. We're we're getting cues. Our surveillance system is getting cues that like we're safe and connecting, and uh, unconsciously, you know, it's under under the surface. Mm -hmm. So when we trust in that that system in a way, and sometimes that that takes more work um, to be able to build that trust. And we're working with someone um, trained can be really powerful in helping you practice the surrender or helping you practice the will of where you might might need to be. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the the do's. Um, for the don'ts, let's see here. I think, I think the don't is don't take a black and white approach. Mm. It can be a yes and um, a both and, and I think that's a, a sign of nervous system flexibility and resilience, where you feel it is a a yes and or um, a we and an us rather than a you and a me, mm. that separateness. So there's a, a certain connection that starts to unfold when we can just keep our ourselves open to possibility and opportunity mm. um, and remembering that it's it's not black and white. It is a it is a hierarchy, yes, it is a ladder, but if we flip it on its side, it is that spectrum that we're dancing back and forth with. And so whether it is starting with movement that you step into the dance, whether it's um, language cues, whether it is sharing in conversation with other humans, sharing a connected look and a smile, mm -hmm. um, all of that is moving you towards that pathway of connection and um, changing your nervous system. So mm -hmm. just being open to that with the the yes and attitude, I think yeah. it's really powerful. Yeah. Not black and white. That is a great piece of advice in many levels. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mirrors, mirrors all of the things in all of the ways <laughs> for sure. Well, well, thank you, Amy, for sharing all this fascinating information. This is You're so this welcome. Really rich stuff. Um, how can someone get in touch with you and learn more about your work? 
Absolutely. So people can find the free resource, the 10 minute Vegas nerve yoga on my website. It is amyhuffman.com forward slash Vegas nerve yoga. And a little more about my, my offerings, my coaching program at amyhuffman.com. You can also find me on, uh, on Instagram at Amy C Huffman. All right. And all of Amy's info will be linked in the show notes. So you're just one click away from connecting with her. And I highly recommend that you do. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Amy. Thank you. This was really, really wonderful. Appreciate you having me. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you receive value from the show, please write us a five-star review and or you can text this episode to just one friend who you know will love yoga and podcasts. We thank you so much in advance for the huge favor. Word of mouth helps support the show in reaching a greater audience and we could not grow without you. If you want to connect with us, our email is yogaandpodcast at gmail.com. The and is spelled out y-o-g-a-a-n-d podcast at gmail. Please follow us on Instagram at yoga and podcast. We are now on TikTok. The handle is also yoga and podcast. When you follow us, we will follow you right back on both platforms. Music is by Mama Duke. Graphics, guest booking, and media by me, your host, Ashley Weber. I am so grateful for you. Thank you for listening.